Welcome to Governance Bites. I'm Mark Benicevic, and today it is my absolute privilege to spend time with Dr. Peter Crow. Peter, thank you very much for your time. Well, it's a pleasure to come and sit with you. Thank you. Thank you. So today, uh, Peter actually is uh, one of the world-renowned experts in governance. Uh, not only does he have a PhD in governance and strategy, he is an independent chair and director on, on a number of boards and has a lot of governance experience, not just in New Zealand, but around the world. Uh, he's also designed and delivered courses for in New Zealand for the Institute of Directors and Governance New Zealand, and also around the world in places as diverse as Kenya, uh, Lithuania, India, and Ireland. Uh, an absolute expert in the field and a real privilege to spend time with you. I really appreciate your time, Peter. Thank you. Look, it's great. Thank you. Given Peter's diverse experience, we're going to talk a little bit about governance around the world. Mm. The first question is, given the, uh, the source of New Zealand governance, it really has come from the UK, from the Westminster system. Yep, that's right. Uh, to start with, are there any significant differences or major differences between governance in the UK and governance in New Zealand? What an interesting, interesting way to start the, uh, the conversation, Mark. That's fantastic. Um, very similar. There's a scale difference. Obviously, the, the, the size of our New Zealand companies gets you into mid-market in the mm. US, and, uh, and, and the length of our history in New Zealand compared that arc of history through the UK. But um, generally speaking, unitary boards um, wanting to do the best. Um, the Companies Act in the in the UK and here it would be I don't know 98% the same. The same seven duties, uh, the same intent to both comply and and um, ensure that we've got performance. So remarkably similar. Right. Is there any difference in terms of the level of experience and expertise of directors in the UK versus directors in New Zealand? Oh look, I think there's a, there's a greater maturity uh, sitting in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, but there's probably a greater enthusiasm here oh, um, as, as, as younger people come through. Um, the vestiges of power, uh, we like holding on to things, and if we've got directors sitting in the UK that have been there for a while, as in one or two other countries around the world, uh, we, let go of, we let go of power um, gradually if we can. Right, right. Well, let's then move to the United States, the largest economy in the world. Yep. Uh, initially, you know, also with a UK background, but uh, it's quite separate from the UK for the last two, 200 years, a little over 200 years, mm. and, uh, and create its own path, um, yep. you know, the seven largest companies uh, on, on the uh, S&P 500 are you know, massive corporations that are larger than most countries, not even many countries, but their, their balance sheets are larger than most countries that are on the planet. Yeah. What are the differences in governance between the United States model and, and the, the UK and, and New Zealand model? So there's a, there's, a, um, there's a fundamental difference right back at the core in that the American system is, is effectively a rules-based system, whereas the Westminster system is much more around principles and practices. So what's the right thing to do in the UK is, does this make sense? Uh, in the US, it's follow the rules. So there's a strong compliance orient orientation in the US. Boards in the, in the Commonwealth countries tend to meet monthly. Boards in the US tend to meet quarterly. Um, boards in the in the UK and other parts around the world, you'll see a separation between the chair and the chief executive. Two different people uh, in the US, much greater overlap. In fact, before year 2000, and when we had WorldCom and Tyco, uh, something like 95%, some huge percentage of all the listed firms in the US, uh, the chair and the chief, or the president, if you will, uh, were the same person to concentration of power. So there's some marked differences and, uh, and a much stronger focus on uh, shareholder economic performance uh, in the US as well. That would suggest that in the US model with the, the president leading the company and both the board and the day-to-day -day operations mm. of the, or the management of the company, it would almost have a feel like a, an advisory board situation where uh, the owner of a business 
takes advice from other people, but then basically makes the decisions. I wonder how much it kind of it feels like that at a US corporation. Elon Musk. Mm, yes. For yeah. example. Great example. Yeah. And and that's and that's what I would that's what I would put back. So answer to your question, yes. Um, many of these um, many of these leaders have got narcissistic tendencies. Um, I'm not suggesting it's a bad thing. Uh, but the board is very much their board mm. as opposed to I'm the chief and I serve the board. It's just that subtlety. The very best boards and the very best chief executives work together really, really well. Yes, yeah, absolutely. What if we then skip across the ditch to Australia? Yep. How different is it in, in the Australian model? New Zealand to Australia? New Zealand to Australia. Difference is scale. Again. Telstra, BHP, you know, larger corporations, uh, but fundamentally scale. There's a little bit more maturity in the listing code with the ASX. Uh, so, uh, for example, here there's no requirement in terms of the maximum number of boards that you can serve on concurrently. Mm -hmm. In Australia, they've realised that um, that serving on a board and that that craft of board work, if you will. Uh, is, is demanding. So one week per board per month, and in fact ASX says no more than four concurrent um, substantive board appointments, and if you're the chair, um, then that counts two, for example. Right. And uh, we don't have that here. So some directors, and there are outliers that are fantastic directors, fantastic chairs, uh, but once you get past about three or four boards, your effectiveness um, can become compromised. So Australia's recognised that, New Zealand hasn't yet. That would suggest that the remuneration for an Australian director must be significantly higher than, uh, for an Australian one, must be significantly higher than for New Zealand, because if you can only do four boards and you want to get a good income out of it, it'd have to be a lot higher than in, in a country where you might sit on six, seven, eight yeah, boards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So um, there's a couple of things in there though. Uh, New Zealand is known as, as um, remunerating directors relatively poorly uh, compared with other um, advanced economies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, I think we can put that almost as a truism that that's the case. Okay, but the other piece is the fiduciary responsibility of directors is, is, a, is a responsibility around service and you've got to do what it takes. And while you want value from the directors, it's not there as an executive income replacement. So uh, maturity and wisdom of the directors, generally you're looking for uh, these directors, um, they may well have had a successful career elsewhere. But now the, the, the coin is turning a little bit and, uh, and it's about service out. So you don't become a director in New Zealand uh, as as our full time package, uh, if you want to get rich. No, no indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and is this you know in areas of Australian law, when it re relates to compliance and regulation, yeah, Australia is often very rules based. Uh, you've described that as being the case in governance in the US. Yeah, is Australian governance more principles based or more rules based or a bit of a mix? So there's so there's the interpretation of what's written as well. Mm -hmm. um, the seven duties in the UK, the same here, the same in the Australia, mm -hmm. right? So at that fundamental level, um, a director here would would be very comfortable and familiar directing in Australia, on uh, and particularly in on a like for like sector or or that sort of you know banking here, banking in Australia, um, mining, whatever it is. So so that's so that's straightforward. Um, where it gets a little bit more compliance oriented is you've got state and federal, yes. um, and and um, uh, uh, Australia does turn to the US a little bit in terms of some of its um, economic and commercial mindset. So there is perhaps a tendency for a little bit more rules based, but fundamentally the lucky country is about principles, and uh, and and I think you would find most of the time. New Zealand, Australia, Canada, UK would be almost the same positioning. Okay, you've also had a lot of experience in Africa. Uh, mm. How is it different in places like Africa and Asia? 
there any differences that you see in those countries? So, so there's there's an interesting there's an interesting development there, and I'm going to tip in Eastern Europe as well, if yes, I may. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so Asia, Eastern Europe, Africa, relative to what we've talked about so far. Uh, are, are relatively young economies and relatively early in their development um, around boards and board work. Yes. Comparatively. Mm -hmm. Yep. And and so what we see in, in for example, Eastern Europe, uh, they have looked to the Baltics, the UK, the US since the, the fall of communism and, and picked the eyes out of the others and assembled it for their context. And they're going gangbusters. They're doing outstanding. Uh, the former British, Portuguese, German, French colonies in Africa um, doing the same thing but they're being even smarter because they're looking at some of the societal pressures, you know ESG for example. Yes. Um, in fact when I was in Kenya late last year, uh, no Peter we don't want to talk about ESG, we just want to run our business. We're there on sustainability but we're not there on three letter acronyms. Mm -hmm. So it's a different level of maturity, and um, in Asia they just want to make money. Okay. You know, and and less. Um, how do I say this politely? The political correctness around describing what we are or what we want. Um, uh, there's um, there seems to be a greater level of comfort of just saying it straight out. Mm -hmm. Like I've sat with Chinese heritage people who said, Peter, you're white, I'm yellow. You wouldn't get away with that in New Zealand, would you? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, now, I've only experienced it twice, and I'm not saying it's common, but there are differences like that, and it's about, uh, it's about making money, it's about economic performance. Um, we've got the safety net of the welfare state, they don't. Yes. And, uh, and so if I can't make money, if I can't uh, feed my family, we've got a problem. Absolutely. In those, in the, yeah, not, not so much Eastern uh, Europe, but certainly in some Asian economies and definitely in Africa. Yes, and I can imagine there'll be differences across Asia as well, because it's so diverse between China, Japan, Southeast Asia. Uh, India. Yes, yeah. yes. So let's, yeah. uh, let's not go, get into the details too much. There, we'll be here. We're, I'd love to be here all day, but I know <laughs> not that we have time to do that. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't asked you about Europe, continental Europe, so, um, Western Europe. How is that different? So there's some interesting things in there that uh, we don't talk about that often. But uh, for example, whereas in America, uh, I mentioned the chair in chief being the you know same, same person. person through until about year 2000. It's changed with the regulatory environment that's since then. Uh, now around about 40 or 50 percent of of listed companies, the chair chief same person. Mm -hmm. 20, 25 years ago, 90, 95 percent. Yes. Uh, in Europe, two tier boards, not unitary. So you've got a supervisory board. Uh, and that's comprised of some shareholder representation, employee union, other. And, and the view is that that provides a more well-rounded uh, perspective in the boardroom. Those supervisory boards meet two or four times a year mm -hmm. uh, and they're much high touch. Then under that you've got what's called a management board, which when you think about it is not actually that dissimilar to an executive suite. But they call it a management board. So it's very much a two-tier model, UK Commonwealth and the US unitary. Yeah. Chief executive goes straight in. So the, that big, the big difference is you basically never, basically never, see a chair and the chief the same person in Europe. Right. That was, and the, the, sh the shareholder um, employee board, yeah. is that the level that has ultimate responsibility? Uh, who then sets strategic direction, manages risk, those sorts of things? Is that split between both boards or is that? So in Europe, the, the management board, the lower board, um, drives the business. Right. Right. The, and, and the upper or the supervisory board is primarily um, in practice about accountability. And, and so you'll see the strategy being approved in the management board and, and there might be a ratification at Superfly. Now, slight differences company to company and country to country. Uh, Germany, for example, two-tier boards um, are part of the landscape. 
um, other countries um, there's the option and then um, yet other countries it's it's unitary so there is a bit of, there is a bit of a range in Europe mm. um, and and uh, and so I'm speaking generally across the continent as opposed to within specific countries but when there is a supervisory board it's more around accountability and stewardship than it is around driving performance that was a quick whirlwind tour of the world really what uh, bad, eh? on differences what do you think across the globe is similar in governance? There's probably about three things actually. Mm -hmm. So first, um, we've, we've got a whole range of external pressures bearing in on commerce. You know, geopolitics, economic turbulence, um, uh, the march of technology, whether it's um, disruptive competitive forces or AI or some tech development. So good all this. So directors are struggling to keep up with those um, with those developments, even if they're reading widely and reading often. So that's first thing. Mm -hmm. Second thing is is um, the expectations amongst. Uh, both shareholders, but now in particular a wider group of stakeholders, those expectations are lifting. So not only do we want economic performance, but we want you to um, to do the right thing socially, and we want you to do the right thing environmentally. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's uh, and that's uh, raising the bar, so to speak. Uh, and and the last similarity. Is, is the complexity that comes from those first two, right? And, and so uh, the, um, the demands on directors um, from a compliance perspective are growing as well, because every time we have a mistake, the tendency is uh, we'll build more rules, yes. which takes you away from performance because you've got more to make sure you're compliant with. Yes. And that's fine, that's fine, but from a from a board perspective, we're there to drive performance. In concert with the law, so the seven duties, in concert if we're listed with the listing rules, and um, and it's very easy to default back to compliance. Yes. Now just because you do all the right things doesn't guarantee high performance. And no. we see that locally with Fletcher Building, we see it um, globally with Carillion and, and a few years ago Volkswagen and FIFA and, and, and um, many others beside. So the, the similarity is there's a lot going on. It's almost like um, chasing a camouflaged uh, moving object behind a camouflaged screen are blindfolded. That's what it <laughs> feels like some days, you know? And, and that's, uh, but that's the game we play. Yes. And so as directors around the world, we need to be prepared to be alert, engaged, have the sense of purpose, uh, and try to do the right thing. Peter, that was a f astounding. Thank you very much for your time. That, I really enjoyed that conversation. I, I'm looking forward to having another conversation soon because there's so many topics I would love to dig mm, into your brain mm. about. But uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us and I'll look forward to seeing you next episode. Thank you for watching this episode of Governance Bites. We have more episodes on YouTube and your favourite podcast channel, where I interview directors and experts on various topics relating to boards of directors and governance. We'd love to see you back, and please like, subscribe, and share the videos and podcasts.